Medicine by Dr. Lawrence Gainey from H HGF Intellectual Property Services. Um, to ask questions, please put your question into the chat box, which you see in the left bottom corner at the moment, and we will get back to them at the end of the talk. Um, otherwise, there aren't any other announcements, and I think we should just start if we can get rid of this bit. I, sorry, it doesn't seem to want to let me move that out of the way. Think. It is out of the way now. Um, yes, Lawrence, I hand over to you then. Okay, it's still on my screen, but uh, hopefully it will disappear. Uh, right, so thank you everybody for, for joining this afternoon or this morning, wherever you're based. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. I'll be talking about intellectual property, taking you through the different types of intellectual property, but focusing a little bit on patents, and it will be at a very basic level. Uh, my name is Lawrence Gainey. I'm a patent director at the life, in the Life Sciences Group at HGF Limited and Intellectual Property Specialists, based mostly in the UK. And so the agenda for today will to take you through the different types of IP. I'll concentrate on patents, uh, the patent filing process, uh, what goes into a patent application, uh, the sorts of data you might need. I'll, I'll give a little bit of a slant towards um, oligonucleotides. And if we have time, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on freedom to operate. So unfortunately, I still have this Q&A box, but I'll, I'll carry on assuming that everybody else can see OK. So different types of intellectual property. As you can see in this sort of um, layout, there are, there are three groups, really, of intellectual property. There are there are those that um, vest automatically. You don't have to do anything to, to get them. They, they arise as soon as you've published your information or provided your information. And it simply provides you with the right to stop people from copying. Um, then the next bucket of intellectual property are those that you need to formally make an application for, typically to the intellectual property office uh, in a particular country. Uh, it gives you um, so a monopoly right over, over your invention or your your mark that you might have. And then in the other bucket for others, uh, this is a sort of what I would class as a quasi monopoly, right? It, it allows you to, to get, get, get a competitive advantage over other people by typically keeping things as a commercial secret. So in terms that those arise automatically, copyright is probably the one that is most commonplace and you'll be most familiar with. Uh, it exists for aesthetic creations from, uh, from publication. So origin, original literary works, such as uh, novels and poems, tables, lists, and computer code, uh, artistic works, paintings, etc., sound recordings, films, broadcasts, uh, typographical arrangements, anything that, that arises which has required some sort of intellectual aesthetic creation. And, and upon publication, it is, is, uh, you can secure some copyright protection to prevent others from copying your precise product, whatever that may be. Um, and there is no artistic threshold for copyright. So um, copyright protection under the law is the same uh, as a, for, a, a, for a finger painting from a five-year-old child as you might get from a, a very famous painting painter like David Hockney. So under the eyes of the law, it's there to, to, to protect direct copying of all those things. Design rights really protects the shape and configuration of articles that you're going to manufacture. So it's typically things like an, a new teapot, the shape of a new, new suitcase, a watch, face, etc. 
um, and that arises automatically on publication. And then in the next category, regulatory data exclusivity, this is um, this is really specific for pharmaceuticals and agrochemicals, products that have had to go through a regulatory assessment to determine whether or not they're safe. And uh, what this protects is the, the ability or, or the non-ability of the health authority to rely on the innovator's clinical data package uh, for assessing you know, generic versions as they come along later. So there's a period of time by which your clinical data package is, is not allowed to be used for um, approving generic versions. So that's regulatory data exclusivity and the, the terms differ. So it, it might be five years in the US up to 12 years for biologics or 10 years in Europe, etc. In the middle, the patents are there to protect new ideas and new inventions. Um, and I'll come on to that in much more detail later on. Uh, then we have um, trademarks. Uh, trademarks are names, uh, phrases, symbols, uh, pictures, or even scents, which um, discriminate between one person's services or products and another. So I heard recently that Hasbro has just secured a trademark in the United States for the scent, the smell of Play-Doh, because that smell is, typifies that particular product and that particular manufacturer. And if used properly, trademarks can last forever in perpetuity. And then we have registered design rights, which is a bit of an expansion on the unregistered design right protection you have. In addition to the shape and the configuration of your article, it also covers surface decoration, colors, etc. And these are typically very important for things like wallpaper uh, and articles of sale like watches and iPad covers, etc. And then trade secrets and know-how, as they as they say, it's it's really uh, protection available to 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 uh, provide. Um, a, monop a quasi monopoly over um, company secrets. So, where a company takes specific efforts to keep something a secret, um, and this might include things like customer lists, uh, gene association mutations, manufacturing know how, or even formula, such as maybe the Coca Cola formula. And if, if it's something that you can keep secret and it's very difficult for somebody else to reverse engineer and work out what it is, that can often be the greatest amount of protection. The Coca-Cola formula has been around for over 100 years and is locked away in a safe, only accessible to a couple of people. Now, in play, um, the various types of intellectual property can, can come together to protect any particular product. So this product that is here on the slide is, is a box of, of a drug called Nexium. If you start on the right-hand side, uh, with trademarks, you know, AstraZeneca had trademark protection for the Nexium name. They had trademark protection for the little logo, the little device, the sort of bubbles that come out above the name. They also had trademark protection for the AstraZeneca name itself and their AZ logo in, in the little gold at the bottom. So that's the trademark protection. In terms of know-how, there would have been a lot of internal secret know-how about how the product was made and processed and how they control contamination, et cetera, where they source their raw materials from, all the sort of green fingers that goes into making the product. I knew that they had some registered design right protection for particular packaging, not this one necessarily, but other blister type packaging where the, the, the pills can be kept in a nice, easily accessible uh, way. There was copyright protection in the packaging itself, but also in the patient information leaflets that go within the products that had to be created. And then, of course, the product itself was protected by various layers of patents. Patents on the compound, salt forms of the compound, polymorphic forms of that, different formulations and combinations, manufacturing processes for making that product, and methods of treatment as well. So all of these different types of intellectual property all come together to provide protection for this product in different forms and different ways. Now let's talk about patents. So what is a patent? Well, a patent is a, is a legal document uh, that defines a claimed invention. And um, as a reward for publishing your invention, you get a legal right to be able to stop anybody else from working that invention without your permission. 
such as by, by giving a license to them. And this monopoly right is for a set period of time, and it's typically 20 years from the effective filing date. Now, the patent systems have evolved throughout the world in order to encourage sharing of information. Rather than keep things secret, it's recognized that if you tell the world what it is, um, that benefits mankind. So patent systems, in exchange for you publishing your invention, you can get this monopoly right. So it's very important that your application, your document, describes the invention sufficiently clearly uh, and identifies the solution to any particular technical problem in a manner that is, can be understood uh, by a person skilled in the art so, so they can read your document and go away and reproduce it. And that invention is described typically at, in length in the application itself using examples typically. Um, and it's defined most appropriately. Oh, hang on, my presentation has disappeared. Uh, uh, the invention is defined verbally at the uh, at the end with a series of claims, which are sort of individual sentences that stand alone and distinguish the claimed invention from the the prior art. Right. Now, it, it's important to recognize that patents are a reverse right. It's not a right that allows you to work an invention. It's actually just a right to be able to stop others from working your invention. And I'll come on to freedom to operate at the end. And it's also something that must be applied for and, it, and, is, and is examined by um, a regulatory body. It is also limited in time, as I mentioned, for 20 years. But equally, patents are national rights. So there's no such thing as a worldwide patent. Um, if somebody, the patentee, the individual, wishes to secure a patent in lots of different territories, then separate national patent applications have to be filed in each of those countries. Now that used to be an extremely onerous and challenging proposition to get all these different applications on file at the same time. And various international um, collaborative um, cooperative re, uh, groups have come together to make uh, the system much more user friendly. And one of these is the Patent Cooperation Treaty. So whilst there's no worldwide patent, there is an international application under the PCT, the Patent Cooperation Treaty, Treaty, which allows you to file a single application and have it centrally processed for a period of time, 30 to 31 months. And then at that later stage, you can decide which of the countries that have signed up to the PCT, and there are 152 territories at the moment that have agreed to, to join this treaty, which of those 152 countries you want to, to convert and secure an individual patent for application into. So why is, is patent protection important? Well, it's a right to prevent others from working your technology. So it can give you a commercial advantage in the sense that if you're the only one who can work it, subject to you having uh, freedom to operate, others uh, are you can keep others off the market, or it's like any property, it's like a house, you can sell it, you can license it, you can mortgage it and get some commercial value out of it. It often protects uh, the investment that's needed uh, in a business strategy uh, and can be the, the pillar for any startup companies or spin out companies that you're you're, you're wishing to set up and is often an essential requirement to secure investment in those companies. Um, in addition, uh, it can be advantageous to file a patent application rather than before you approach individuals to discuss any commercialization for two reasons. Firstly, it shows that you have confidence in your invention um, and that you've got something on file. And secondly, it potentially avoids any contractual or inventorship disputes that uh, there might be later on. Excuse me, I've just uh, dipped through to my Okay, so I just thought it'd be useful to, to list a couple of, a, a few examples of the types of things that could be patentable in the sort of biotherapeutic arena. So oligos and, and antibodies, etc. So subject to a few territories and the US is one, isolated genes uh, and, and how they're used in expression vectors and promoter systems and host cells that contain them. They're typically 
still patentable subject matter, barring the US. Biomarkers and the way that, that you can use them to, to stratify patients into subgroups for um, uh, giving drugs, for example, are patentable. Novel proteins, antibodies or antibody fragments. Um, so this uh, modified nucleic acids, including antisense oligos or SARNA, and chemistry associated with those oligos, tagged molecules, and, and ways of getting oligos, et cetera, into the body. Um, these are all patentable subject matter, as are pharmaceutical compositions containing them. And in the United States, methods of treatment and in Europe and other territories, medical uses. So this is, um, this is a non-exhaustive list um, focusing on, on biotherapeutics, but there are lots of different types of subject matter uh, that's patentable. Now, what is uh, needed to get a patentable invention? There are, there, are, there are a number of essential criteria. I've listed the five main ones here. First of all, um, the invention must not be something that's within a category that's excluded as such from patenting. And there are a number of patentable exclusions in different countries, um, but mostly these are things like discoveries and mathematical formula, methods of performing business or presenting information. Those are sort of uh, more discoveries and, and, and applications, uh, but also there are some other exceptions, um, such as methods of treatment, or in, U in the US, you know, uh, laws of nature, for example, I'll touch on that in a second. But the most important two criteria then are that the invention must be new, it must not have been disclosed in the public do domain before filing date of your application, and it then must be inventive, it must be something that's not obvious over what was known before. Another criteria is that the invention must be capable of industrial application. It has to have some sort of use. And then the document that describes your invention must be sufficiently disclosed. And this is the quid pro quo that I mentioned at the beginning, whereby in order for you to get a patent, you have to have taught the world what your invention is. So your document must be sufficiently described. Otherwise, uh, keeping things out on purpose can, can result in invalidity. So now let's talk about some of the exclusions relevant for, for the life sciences. So as I mentioned in, in Europe, methods of diagnosis or, or treatment carried out on the human body are, are not patentable. But that said, products for use in those methods are still patentable. Now in the United States, uh, under this particular code that's listed there, um, laws of nature and natural products have now been deemed to be unpatentable subject matter. Now, these are, these are judicial exceptions. These are exceptions that have been set up by the court system. Um, so if we look at, at an example of a potentially patentable invention, a claim at the bottom, you've got a, a, an isolated nucleic acid or nucleotide sequence comprising a particular sequence which is set out in a sequence listing. Um, if that was novel and inventive, you would be able to get that type of claim in Europe. But now, under the way that the interpretation is in terms of natural products, an isolated nucleic acid sequence would be a natural product. Typically, you, you would unlikely get that patent uh, claim granted in, in the US. Now, one of the most crucial criteria for patentability is it has to be novel. Your invention must not have been disclosed or put into the public domain prior to your patent application. So what counts as a public disclosure? Well, it's, it's pretty much anything. It could be an earlier filed or published patent application. Typically, it might be a journal article, scientific journal, or a press release, or a conference, or maybe a presentation that you've made, even a PhD thesis. Even if that PhD thesis is sitting on a library shelf and it hasn't been accessed for 20 years, that is still something that's within the public domain and can be relevant for patentability uh, determination. Um, it doesn't also have to have been in, in, on paper, any publication in any form. So if even you know, electronic publications on the internet are relevant as prior art, uh, or any public use. So if somebody uh, you know, invents a new uh, gearing mechanism for a bicycle, and they cycle up, cycle up and down a road with it, such that people can see what the new gearing is and work out what it is, that pub public use is sufficient um, to invalidate your invention. So all these things have to be taken into consideration when you know, determining what is in the public domain. And any oral disclosure, particularly outside of a confidentiality agreement, can be a public disclosure. So it's essentially any non-confidential disclosure in any form, in any country, and in any language prior to your effective filing date. 
Now, I put an asterisk there because in some countries, such as the United States and Japan, it is still possible uh, to secure a patent after you've made a publication. So there is, there is a provision for a grace period in the United States of up to 12 months from the publication of an inventor before they need to file their patent application. However, that exclusion and that provision does not exist globally. So um, you have to ask yourself, is the ability to only secure a US patent or a patent in only a couple of countries going to be good enough? And if you wish to commercialize it and have it licensed or acquired by a large global company like a pharmaceutical, and having only a US patent covering your product it may not be attractive commercially. So be very careful when you're out there talking at conferences uh, with, with other academics um, outside of a confidentiality agreement, because all of those disclosures could potentially be relevant for patentability later on. Now on to novelty. A simple difference is all you need to establish novelty. So in this example, let's supposing there was a process that involved a flow rate of 10 liters per second. Well, if you come along later at 11 liters per second, that is novel. Nobody's done that before. So it's a very objective assessment. Or in the oligonucleotide space, perhaps there's a, a native oligonucleotide sequence that's known in the public domain, and you change one or more of the bases using a non-natural base, maybe uh, two oxymethoxyethyl. Now that change imported onto that oligo makes that then a novel oligo. So novelty is a very objective uh, criteria to address. Inventive step is the next criteria you need to have. And, the, and the, the rationale really is that you shouldn't be able to patent something which is a, a trivial change, an obvious adaptation of something that was already known. Now, inventive step is very subjective. And this is judged through the eyes of what's called a person of skill in the art, or a person skilled in the art. Um, An inventive step is usually the area where patent attorneys like myself get into the most amount of arguments with, with examiners as to what is inventive and not, because it is truly subjective. So how do you know if something that you've made is, is obvious or not? Well, perhaps you can ask yourself some, some simple questions. Now, is there anything surprising or unexpected about, about what you have done? Have you solved a technical problem in the field which was, was up till then was, was, was not uh, overcome? Are you de departing from conventional wisdom? And answers to these can sometimes give you some ideas as to whether or not what you've done is inventive. So let's go back to our simple example, the flow rate. You've moved from 10 liters to 11 liters per second. So you know, ask yourself, well, what effect did moving to that 10 liters per second have? Perhaps this has caused a lot of uh, so giving you some surprising results. Maybe you've got some better mixing, increased stability or crystallinity of whatever product. Could, that, could those enhancements have been predicted? Um, does the prior art teach towards a higher flow rate up to 11 liters per second, in which case perhaps your invention is obvious, or maybe it teaches away. Maybe there's a document that says, under no circumstances should you go above 10 liters per second. And you have found that by doing that, you've gone against conventional wisdom. In those circumstances, there are arguments to be had for saying that you've come up with something that is unpredictable and therefore inventive. So in light of what is known to the person skilled in the art is, is how it is judged. So if the prior art discloses um, you know, a particular new gene uh, or a molecule against a gene, but it has you know, oligo against a gene, but it has poor affinity, but it's also known that by changing that um, oligo to with some some chemistry, the two oxymethoxy ethyl modification, for example, to your ASO, then whilst the claim to the ASO would be novel because nobody's put those two O M E O M O E molecules on there, the question would be: Is it obvious? If you know that putting two M O E's onto a molecule enhances the affinity then you're going to be faced with a prima facie obvious argument subject to any unexpected properties that you might have with that particular molecule. Now, I mentioned that one of the criteria is industrial applicability. So your invention must have some sort of industrial or commercial use. So if you, if you clone a new gene, um, but you don't know what that is, well, that's a mere discovery. Um, it has no practical use. And so in the eyes of the patent system and the national laws of patents, you, it's not patentable. 
because it lacks this utility. However, if you know what it does, you know, perhaps it's a kinase or it's a particular type of receptor, and you can make use of that in, an, in a technical way, for example, as a screen for the new modulator compounds, then in addition to be able to protect the screen itself, you should also be able to protect the, um, the molecule, um, the gene or the protein in Europe, certainly in lots of jurisdictions, but not so much in the US because that would be deemed um, product of nature. There's a bit of feedback on the phone, on the, on the, on the line, so hopefully that will clear. Right. Now let me take you through uh, pattern five. And So this is to illustrate the sort of route that you would need to, need to go through to, to make a pattern filing. First of all, you come up with your idea here. You've made a you come up with a decision to make a pattern filing. You draft your application and you file it at a, a national patent office. This could be the US Patent Trademark Office or the UK Intellectual Property Office. And that sort of, uh, you're, you're planting your, the flag in the sand there. You've got your application on file, you've got your um, filing date. Then in the next 12 months, this is what's called uh, a Paris Convention convention year or the priority year. And in that period, you can update your application, uh, supplement it with new examples, expand it slightly, and then claim back priority from the first filing. So the first filing is typically called a priority document or a non-provisional application. At 12 months, you then have to file your patent application proper. You can either do it by filing national applications in all the different countries that you want, or as I mentioned earlier, you can take advantage of this patent cooperation treaty international application and file a single application, claiming back to the earlier filing date from the first filing, and then designating all the countries in the PCT up to 152. Now, at that stage, the application is cast in stone. You can't make any changes to it. It will go to, it will be searched and examined for prior art, and it will publish at 18 months from the first priority date here. So from that date, it will be 18 months before it publishes. It then sort of sits in limbo for a while, uh, and then you, at 30 months, or 31 months in some countries, you have to make a decision to convert this international application into whatever countries you want to secure patent protection. So you might want to file in Europe, US, Japan, China, India, etc. Each of those countries you have to convert this application into. This PCT application then ceases to exist. It can't become a patent itself, it's just a vehicle. And then you're in, on the straight of trying to pursue individual patents in different countries, and that typically can take you Know, three, four, five more years before you get a series of granted patents. So the PCT system has been set up to provide a very convenient, cost-effective vehicle in which to file patents and delay the, the timing by which you have to decide which of the countries to go into. Now, Patent term is normally 20 years from the filing date, but it's 20 years from the national filing date or the PCT filing date. So in effect, if you add on the one year that when you're in your Paris or priority convention year, it's 21 years from the first date that you file your patent is when the patent nominally expires. But in some countries, you can get patent term extensions um, to compensate for um, regulatory assessment periods that go on particularly if you're involved with pharmaceutical or agrochemical products. So in Europe, United States and Japan, typically, um, because you, you know, you're, you're unlikely to be able to sell your therapeutic drug on day one of your patent filing, it may take you 10 years of delay before it's approved. That's effectively eating into your, your patent period. So to compensate for that um, delay, you can get up to five years typically in those countries of an extension at the end. And that can be very valuable because as an example, with Prozac, about 80% of all total sales in the United Kingdom occurred in that five-year period, in that extension period. So the ability to do that can be very valuable. Um, the United States has, has other provisions. They have patent term adjust adjustments, whereby 
any delays that have been incurred by uh, uh, at the fault of the patent office in getting your patent granted over a, a nominal period um, you can get that back at the end and that, that just tags onto the end regardless of the subject matter but that, that's that's uh, perhaps for a different day right let's talk about the contents of a patent application now so this is a typical layout um, of a patent application. Um, it'll start with a cover page that's got the bib bibliographic information on there, who the applicant is, what the title is, the abstract, the key filing dates. Um, it'll then have an introduction, it'll set the field, uh, give you a bit about the background. Then you'll, you'll get into more, more detail of what the, dis the invention is itself, a bit of a summary of the invention. Um, and then a detailed description of what the invention is, lots of different fallback positions. You may have some examples at the end. Um, you will have claims that define what your invention is. You may have figures, you may have sequence listings, particularly if you're working with oligos, and then you'll have an abstract. So that's, that's the typical layout. Now, patent applications can be extremely challenging to understand as they are a mixture of scientific and sort of legal language, uh, which has sort of been refined over years. Um, but, and the, you know, often people think there's also a lot of repetition in there. Um, so that's the typical layout. But it, but when you when you drill down more deeply, it has two main parts. It's got a claims part, which defines your inventions. It defines, helps to define who the inventors are. And it helps the patent office and the courts to understand the scope of the invention. And then it has a description, which describes the invention clearly enough for it to be carried out by the person skilled in the art. In the art. It has, a lo it has lots of exemplification and description and, and definitions of terms. It has a lots of fallback positions uh, and different you know, variables that you could put in. And the description is used to help interpret the claims. So the analogy here is, is really, the claims are a bit like an island. So um, it sort of defines the boundary of protection that you're securing here, the land part. So if you're on the land, you're within the scope of the claim, you're potentially infringing unless you can get granted permission to come onto it. Uh, if you're within the water, you're outside the scope of the claim, you're not infringing. Um, the claims to start to describe the structure of the invention in precise and exact terms using this sort of long established formal style and precise terminology can be quite difficult to, to grasp to this initially. There's some particular words that, which are used, which are, which are well understood within the patent fields, like the difference between comprising, consisting, consisting essentially of, wherein, characterized in. But this, this is language which, is, which has evolved over many years. And, and effectively, the claims there just mark the boundaries of your invention. Now, the description um, must describe the invention completely, as I've mentioned. It must be an enabling disclosure. So you can't withhold essential features for putting the invention into practice. Because if you would do that, if you do that, and the courts deem that to be uh, something you've done on purpose, the invention might not be enabling. Either the patent might not grant, or it might be deemed non-enforceable. So you need a full and frank disclosure of all the essential elements needed to carry out your invention. Let's talk a little bit about data, because there's often a question that arises. What types of data or examples will I need in my application? Well, I've identified here three sort of types of data that you're going to need. First of all is characterizing data. You need to have data in there that, that characterizes the product that you're trying to claim. So if it's a new chemical entity, perhaps you've got some mass spectrometry data, also some nuclear magnetic resonance data that define helps to define what the product is. So somebody can run a test and know when when they've got something in their hand, whether or not it's the same product as you. Or maybe it'll be the structure. If it's an oligonucleotide, it'll probably be the sequence and or details of the different chemicals or chemical changes that you've got at different positions. Or if it's another product, it might be a crystalline form. You know, there could be some other, other characterizing data that you could use. So first of all, you need data that helps characterize and identify what the product is. Next, you're going to need some utility data, some data that shows that the product can do something. It has, it solves a technical problem. It has some biological activity. Now, you don't need, if, it, if it's a therapeutic product, for example, you're not going to need clinical data. The patent office have recognized that delivering clinical data is just too high a burden. But you're going to need some sort of credible 
biological data, perhaps in vitro data, perhaps in an animal model or in, or in vitro cell, cell assay, which is representative and demonstrates that the compound has an effect in a biological system. And based on that, it's likely that the molecule will have utility later on, you know, in a pharmaceutical setting, for example. The utility data is also required for you know, ensuring you've got an inventive step and that you're meeting the industrial applicability criteria. Um, and it needs to be commensurate with the scope of the claim that you're trying to secure. So if you're trying to claim a very, very broad scope covering millions of different compounds, you're going to need to have representative compounds across the different scope of that claim. If you've just come in with one or two examples from a, a wide chemical family, you're unlikely to be able to secure broad claims to that. And it needs to present at least, you know, a credible uh, or plausible teaching that the claimed invention solves a technical problem. Then the third type of data to consider, it's not necessary, it's not essential, but it's very advantageous, particularly when you're talking about oligos or other biotherapeutic products, is comparative data. So it may well be that you're coming along with a product uh, where other people have already proposed molecules against a particular target. So you're coming along with an oligo against KRAS, there may be oligos against KRAS already in the public domain. So you may well need, those molecules will then be the closest prior art. And you are likely to need some comparative data uh, between your molecule and what is in the closest prior art in order to be able to demonstrate, demonstrate that your molecule has superior properties or some properties which are unexpected or different from what was known. Um, so if an advantageous effect does come along relative to prior art and you've got that data in the application and filed, it makes it much easier to argue the inventive step criteria um, with a patent office. Now, if you don't have the data to hand at the time of filing, you know, consider generating that data later on because you, you will likely need to provide some data to the patent offices to satisfy themselves that your molecule is superior to something that's already known. If your molecule is exactly the same or even you know, sometimes worse than other molecules that are out there, they're going, to, they're going to allege that it's not inventive. It's just another type of molecule. It's nothing special. So those are the three character, uh, types of data that you might consider needing for your application. So finally, I'll just touch on freedom to operate. So I've mentioned that a patent is a negative right. So having a patent doesn't give you the right to work that invention. All it does is allow you to stop other people from working that invention. So there might, and the reason is that there might be a broader patent that dominates, an earlier patent that dominates your activities nevertheless. Um, and it's very important, therefore, if you've got to go into a commercial setting to make sure you identify third party patents that might be out there that dominate uh, the particular product or service that you that you wish to sell. So for example here, you may indeed be able to get a patent in blue um, on a particular compound, um, for example, to treat uh, a particular disease. But if somebody has a much broader patent that was filed earlier than you and it overlaps and you fall within that patent, in order for you to exploit this, you, you would still need a, a license from this party here, or you need to make sure that this patent is, is not valid or not enforceable. So this is what freedom to operate is. The difference between patentability, um, which is getting a patent, and freedom to operate, which is the ability to actually exploit your commercial product or service. And that takes me to the end of this uh, introduction to, to intellectual property and patenting. Uh, as I say, my name is, is Lawrence Ganey. I'm a patent director at HGF, and I'd be happy to um, address and answer any questions that you might have. Um, now or, or later on. And this here is just some information about HGF, the patent firm that I work for. Over to you, Patrick. Um, let me see. And the question was from Durian Prince regarding inventiveness do improvements of a patented aso by changing the secondary structure to enhance affinity for example stereoisomers fall on the prior art of that patent 
or is the use of stereoisomers with that ASO inventive? Are you familiar with stereoisomers, Lawrence? Yes, yes. So, um, in, indeed, if, if that stereoisomer hadn't been disclosed, if that particular isomer hadn't been disclosed in the prior art, and you've changed it, you've come along with a different one, and it has different properties, it could be patentable over and above what was disclosed in the earlier patent. Now, if that patent, if the earlier patent was agnostic in terms of the types of um, isomers that it was protecting, it just listed the nucleotide sequence, for example, or in the chemistry field, it just listed the structure, rather whether, whether it was L or R configuration. That earlier patent might cover all versions, so it might still be a dominating patent, but you could still come along later with um, uh, identification of a particular stereoisomer which has enhanced or superior unexpected properties and get a patent just on that isomeric form. Um, if you wanted to exploit that, as I mentioned in the last couple of slides, you would still need a license likely under the first one. So if, if I take you back to that earlier um, slide when I talked about Nexium, that's exactly you know, one of the patents that they had there was um, was isomeric forms uh, of um, of the product. Um, no, I can't find it now. But it, here, so they they had um, they had a polymorphic form, which is an isomeric form of uh, from the not the racemic mystery. It was a particular polymorphic form. So in the similar vein, um, you could do that with with isomerics. But then the question would be, how inventive is it? If you've got superior properties, you've got a good chance of, of arguing that it's not something that's predictable. But the patent office is now, if I'm thinking about chemicals, where, where there might be two particular uh, isomeric forms, the patent office has sort of recognized that it's likely that one form is, is going gonna, is gonna to have more activity than another. So it's, you're going to still have to address how obvious it was to move to that particular form. But a good question. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Please type into the chat box if you if there's any more questions. Nope. Well, I have one for you, oh, Lauren. <laughs> so, thinking about sequences. See, you were saying it. If we change one nucleotide to a different nucleotide, it, that's then novel and, you know, would not necessarily be covered by a previous patent. Correct. So is that just the chemical modification or would that be a different nase as well? Or how, how is that? Anything, as long as, it, as long as it's distinguished over what was in the public domain. So if it was a, if it was a base difference, then clearly that's, that's a difference. So you'd, you'd, you'd overcome the novelty hurdle, but the inventive step hurdle would be a big one, I think, in those circumstances. If you're talking mm -hmm. about a change to a gene sequence, for example, you know, everybody know, you know, no, there is no single gene sequence. There's lots of um, polymorphisms, natural polymorphisms within, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity within the population. So um, even though your version, your, your adapted version may, may be novel, it may well be deemed to be something that which is commonplace and obvious over something in the prior art. Unless your particular uh, molecule had some stellar, surprising, unexpected properties. Uh, maybe by making this particular mutation, you increase the half-life dramatically or the affinity or um, and, and that, that's something that, based on all the theoretical changes you could have made, that's something that's not predictable. Then you could, you could address and potentially overcome the inventive step challenge. Okay. And so for, for the example data that you need, how much, say you have an oligo, do you have to cover the whole sequence surrounding of the oligo with other oligos? Or is it enough to just have your you know, best oligo, and would that block all the nucleotides within the oligo sequence from someone else, or can someone else just move the oligo over, say, two bases or something like that? 
it really would depend on the scope of the claim that you're trying to secure. So if you had if you had a, a tenma oligo of a defined sequence, you know, A, A, C, G, T, T, whatever, then and you've got data for that oligo, if you're claiming just that oligo, then if somebody changes it, moves it, you know, to the left or right or changes a couple of those bases or one base, they fall outside the claim because they're no longer with on, on your island. But if you're claiming an oligo based on and allowing for variability, you're claiming an oligo and something that has 70% sequence identity, and you, you define ways of separating out and working out what that means, you know, allowing for two or three changes, then clearly, you know, mathematically, you're covering thousands of different permu permutations there. So in order to get that broader claim, which is good for protection against somebody just changing something slightly, but in order to get that, you're going to have to have some representative examples of other oligos that fall within that claim uh, and, and demonstrate the same utility as, as the main oligo that you're claiming. So the broader the claim scope that you're seeking in terms of the greater variability or the, the more molecules that you're trying to capture, the more data you're going to need to demonstrate to the patent office that A, the invention works across all the different changes. You know, making these changes doesn't change the fact that this oligo can bind to this particular epitope or this receptor, or um, that you've that you've uh, legitimately got enough data to, to to protect that risk scope. And this is this is a difficult question because you know if you've only got one or two compounds or one or two examples, one or two oligos, one or two antibodies, it's difficult to persuade the patent office to give you broad claims allowing for a lot of variability because their, their, their argument would be that even a single change could dramatically affect the function um, and therefore without data to demonstrate that changes don't change the function indeed the function is still maintained um, and maybe you've got a, maybe you've got a domain which 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 can accommodate lots of variability um, you may be able to get some broad claims around that provided you've demonstrated that with, with examples so just to follow on, um, if you don't have your sequence surrounding of your target um, oligo, but even moving it one base over doesn't work at all, would you still submit that data or? Um, yes, because you're, you're then giving some data to show that your particular claimed oligo that you're, you're including is is uh, works and, and things structurally similar don't work. Um, so if you if you're shifting it one or two bases along along the length of the gene and they suddenly stop working, then you've you've narrowed you'd have to narrow in claims to your precise molecules that you that, that are working. But you also have very good data to show that molecules of similar structure or, or hitting very close or the same epitope don't work. So it can help um, to demonstrate you know an inventive step over. Uh, over over other prior art molecules. Okay, well, thank you very much for answering our questions. I don't seem there don't seem to be any more questions from the audience. So I guess we'll thank you very much for giving this presentation for us, Lawrence. That was very kind of you. And, You're welcome. Uh, My pleasure. Um, his contact details are available on, on the um, presentation, so you can contact him if you want to. Um, please keep an eye out for the next webinar on the OT. It will be about microRNA, but I'm still um, in contact with the possible presenters about when they could do it. Thank you very much again. And I'll close the session. Okay, thank you everybody for your time. Cheerio. Bye bye.